Happy 350th, New Jersey. The charter which established New Jersey is on view at the state capitol in Trenton through the summer of 2014. Join us for a tour of Jersey to see how artists are celebrating its 350th anniversary. We have David Biancooli on the birth of the American film industry in New Jersey, an illustrator with his own take on Whitman's Song of Myself, a Newark-based opera company premiering a new work about native son Paul Robeson, and more. The New Jersey State Council on the Arts, encouraging excellence and public engagement in the arts since 1966, is proud to co-produce State of the Arts with Stockton College, New Jersey's distinctive public college. Additional support was provided by the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, supporting leadership, innovation, and collaboration for a better New Jersey. In 2014, the Raritan River Music Festival presented a series of concerts to celebrate more than three centuries of music in New Jersey. First, a look back to colonial days with the original music group Chatham Baroque, playing in the historic Prosville Mills. The music from this concert is from about 1700, 1710, 1715. It's all part of the celebration for the 300th anniversary of Hunterdon County, founded in 1714. This is our 300th anniversary, the 25th anniversary of Raritan River Music Festival, and of course the 350th of New Jersey. Chatham Baroque has come here before, and we've been very happy with their performances. And we wanted uh, a group that specializes in early music. They play all that music that you could hear other groups play on modern instruments. They do it on the antique instruments. This is called an arch lute. And um, it's kind of like the bishop and the archbishop. It's like a lute, but a little bigger. So it's like an, a, a big lute because it has this extra long neck. And I don't know if you have it in the frame, but it goes clear out, you know, six feet long almost. Say there's a, a bass part that goes like that, like a bass line. So I would, I would play you know, I could, I could harmonize it that way. Something like that. When Mount Holly artist Alan Crawford decided to illustrate a literary classic, he didn't need to look too far to find the text that would captivate his visual imagination, Walt Whitman's 1855 poem, Song of Myself. Growing up in southern New Jersey, you couldn't escape the fact that you were walking in Whitman's footsteps. He, he went to the shore, he went to the Pine Barrens, he, he lived in Camden, he's buried in Camden. So there was a local connection and that was something that personally resonated with me. The book that I've illustrated is almost like a visual journal of Whitman's poetic landscape. I designed the book to be a certain size so that it can be rotated in your lap so you can read it as I kind of wrap type around the imagery. A child said, what is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my own disposition out of green stuff hopeful woven. It really forces you to slow down and the images kind of hold you there. And hopefully what that does is it forces people to really absorb what Whitman is trying to say. There are astronauts 
in this book. There are kids playing basketball in this book. There is a neighborhood in South Philly in this book. Whitman dealt in the here and the now, and if you're going to be interpreting Whitman, you have to do the same thing. I'm not necessarily giving you a literal visual interpretation. I'm giving you a mood. It's more about the mood of the poem than it is about me depicting the poem. You had to basically take small bites out of the poem in order to really do it any justice. So I went through the, the verse paragraphs and I bracketed out how I wanted them to flow through the pages of my book, going by theme or mood or subject so that each spread is its own little world. After that world has expended itself in the poem, it moves on to the next world. It's almost like a string of pearls. A lot of miniature poems within the larger epic poem. And that was a real challenge. You're wrestling with a new bit of text every single day and figuring out how that was going to be expressed visually. Then you had to go to a sketch phase where you're sketching it out on tracing paper. You would throw that up on the light box and then you would render all of it in its final form and you're revising it with each phase. That would take about 10 to 12 hours every day to do, just two pages. It was a labor of love, but it took its pound of flesh too. My knees are still kind of recovering from that. This is how, as a physical object, I imagine Song of Myself to be. Ideally, I would love it if people would read a spread per day and spent four months with the thing, you know, take it in and just absorb the poem. I just hope in 50 years somebody finds it in their attic, takes it down and goes, wow, this is great, you know, who did this? This is the first film ever made in the United States, and it was made in New Jersey. This is just the beginnings of film. It's a miracle to me that we have these. But within like a year or two, they figure out a new way to do it and put the sprockets in and presto, it's clear. And then, you know, in the 1890s, we get serious, good-looking film. The first motion picture studio ever set up in the world was in the yard of my laboratory at West Orange. That's the one and only Thomas Edison taking a break from his retirement in Fort Myers, Florida to reminisce about the birth of the motion picture industry at his lab in West Orange, New Jersey. His company created America's first movie studio, nicknamed the Black Mariah, for its resemblance to police paddy wagons in 1893. One of their most popular films was The Boxing Cats. It's from 1894. Think how long ago 1894 is. And here's a 30 second film of cats with boxing gloves on that are being held up and forced to sort of slap at one another. And it's the internet. It's just the internet had to wait more than 100 years to be, but it's, you know, when you're gonna make these 30 second films and you're gonna put them into little things that people either drop their money in or not, uh, you have to figure out once you figure out how to film them, you got to figure out who wants to see what. And do people want to see cats doing stupid things? In 1894, yes. In 2014, yes. It's just amazing to me that we haven't gotten any smarter. But there you are. The motion picture industry exploded in the 1890s, especially in New Jersey. Fort Lee was the Hollywood of the era, the original studio system. Film had evolved from an experiment in a lab to a novelty item to big business. Great Train Robbery is a famous film, and it's famous not only because it told a straight narrative, uh, sort of from start to finish uh, about train robbers who got their comeuppance. Uh, but in the end, uh, it had uh, a gunman pointing his gun right at the audience and shooting, and this caused a panic. I'm sure not everybody fell for this, uh, but enough people did that it's, it's famous. And there we go, uh, filmed around uh, New Jersey and a, a famous Western, even though it was an Eastern. 
California has since taken the spotlight, but New Jersey remains a prominent feature in our media landscape and the public imagination. New Jersey's relationship with the movies starts at the beginning and never ends. And new generations are always rediscovering it. To keep all of this history straight, David B. N. Cooley, founder of the popular blog TV Worth Watching and longtime contributor to NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, gathered together a panel of his fellow critics to chronicle New Jersey-based or focused film and television for the official NJ350 website. It wasn't a completely comprehensive list, but it was the things that made an impact for one reason or another. I mean, for television, Jersey Shore has to be mentioned, you know, but not positively, but it has to be mentioned. HBO gave us both The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire, so it gave us sort of the most fascinating TV shows about Jersey, past and present. I ran the odds on the way down. On what? Whether you'd attempt to kill me. What'd you come up with? 14 to one, against. One of the best things about the show, I should say this in, specifically, is the opening sequence, which, you know, goes right on the New Jersey Turnpike, takes you to, uh, you know, to Tony Soprano's, you know, world uh, in a way that makes you a co-conspirator before the program even begins. The Writers Guild West called it the best written television series ever made. I would say it's certainly in the top two or three. I mean, it is that good. Uh, and the performance, the central performance by James Gandolfini, it doesn't get any better than that. And, and here's a, a show that told about a particular place and time uh, with a particular class of people on the margins of or completely outside the law, but did it in a way that humanized them and, and made them both funny and scary and real and, to me, unforgettable. Jersey is many places, many people, many accents, uh, but it is a rich mine for characterization. We're still finding New Jersey is a great place to mine in terms of subject matter. A recreation of Leutz's famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware was part of I Heart New Jersey, a workshop presentation by Roxy Ballet Company. The parameters were basically a little loose. I said, this has to be about New Jersey. I just ask you to create with New Jersey in mind. Based in Lambertville, New Jersey, the professional company often tries out new works in their own rehearsal studios before moving to a bigger stage. That's really what we're all about here. The I Heart New Jersey show was another example of us being able to freely experiment and create work with live musicians and, and do things that are really adventurous. <laughs> I am the narrator. I am the uh, Jay Leno of Lambertville. And Alani and Serena playing music and then uh, the other Music is my music. This song's called Days of 49 or James Marshall. Richard Jarbo is the narrator of I Heart New Jersey. He sings in the show. He has a, uh, a piece that he does based on uh, the life of James Marshall, who is from Lambertville and is responsible for finding the first flake of gold in the California gold I rush. Found the flake. I Heart, or I Love, New Jersey was a collaborative effort in every way. The choreographers were members of the company. The world is better when you're down. One dance featured Atlantic City during the Roaring Twenties, set to music by New Jersey's own Count Basie. Other dances featured live music performed by a twin sister duo from Flemington, New Jersey. Turn 
Nilani and Serena are two amazing gems, uh, wonderful singers, songwriters. I wanted to be able to create something that celebrated life here in New Jersey. And, and really that, for me, was the inspiration. Today we were working on uh, Robeson by Adolphus Hailstorm, which is on a libretto by the wonderful uh, Chanel Perry. Good morning, Sister Mary. Good morning, Brother John. I'm rehearsing today with uh, Toughest Zimbabwe, who is our associate music director. And uh, he is, of course, the lead pianist for Saturday Night Live. I found Africa. And fought hard, and fought hard to mend those ties. Here I stand. When I Trilogy Opera Company has commissioned composer Adolphus Hailstort to write an opera about the legendary singer, actor, athlete, and civil rights leader Paul Robeson. This is the 350th anniversary of New Jersey. How can you not include Robeson? It's impossible. He is the hugest figure that has ever come out of New Jersey, out of America. If everyone actually knew about Robeson, they would just be just floored. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. It's a very controversial subject matter, and also Robeson is very, very dear to the uh, population, if you will, and uh, you must get it right. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Alone. I think it's very important to know, number one, that he was very, very uh, concerned about the plight of his people. He was also very, very much concerned about how one would frame him. And when they tried to accuse him of being something that uh, he wasn't, he was very forceful about it. He said, no, I am not a member of the Communist Party. So Robeson is important to us, not just because of his voice and his stature, but because he really cared deeply. There's one thing that he says that I love. It's, he says, just a moment. This is something that I challenge very deeply and sincerely. The fact that the success of a few people including Jackie Robinson or myself, can make up for thousands of Negro families in the South. My father was a slave, and there are many in my family who were sharecroppers, and I do not see my success in terms of myself. That is why my success has never meant what it should mean. I have sacrificed literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, for what I believe in. That's Robeson. I took a stand and searched for justice and for peace. 
Trilogy is an opera company that focuses on the works of black composers in all subject matter that is relative to the black experience. Oh, tell me why, why, why did the dinosaurs die? die, die. Are they way up there? in that jungle in the sky. The New Jersey State Museum is celebrating the 350th with a visit from the official state dinosaur, Hattie, and paleo artist, Jason Poole. How I wish that we, we could really know. My job is to, to flesh out or illustrate what uh, Hadrosaurus fulci, the skeleton behind me, uh, would look like with skin and, and uh, fatty tissues and muscles, and so basically make it look like it would have when it was alive. Kids and dinosaurs uh, go hand in hand. I can't go to family outings uh, and let anybody know that I work with dinosaurs because I end up at the kids' table. The first pieces were found in 1838, but back then people didn't really know what they were finding, and they'd use them for th things like door stops and ashtrays and things like that. While seven U.S. states have official dinosaurs, New Jersey's Hadrosaurus fulci is probably the most important. This is one of the most important dinosaurs in the world because it was, it was the world's first relatively complete dinosaur skeleton ever found. It was first found um, in 1838 in Haddonfield, New Jersey. It was more excavated in, about 20 years later by Joseph Leidy and William Falk and a few others. So this bone is a toe. These are uh, vertebrae, so all parts of the backbone. You can see the neural canal right there where the spinal cord would go through. They went to the center of intellectual America, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, they were taken there and uh, studied Joseph Leidy, one of the greatest paleontologists of all time. Uh, he himself studied it. America's first dinosaur, and really the first one in the world that you could really mount and study. It's probably around 70, 70 million years old. Haddonfield at the time was actually underwater. The shoreline was farther north and west of there. Um, because it was so hot and because there was no ice at the poles, sea levels were much, much higher, maybe 300 feet higher. Hattie, as we like to call it, became the official state dinosaur in 1991, and that was all thanks to an elementary school teacher, I believe in Haddonfield, who led her students in a letter writing campaign to the state legislature trying to get this dinosaur as the official state dinosaur of New Jersey. Uh, it's been given a number of nicknames over the years by one person or another. Uh, Hattie is a common name. Uh, incidentally, uh, Hattie doesn't signify Haddonfield. Uh, Hattie signifies uh, bulky, so it was uh, literally Hadrosaurus, folks bulky lizard. And uh, it's commonly mistaken that it was named for Haddonfield, but it wasn't. Nevertheless, Haddonfield is very proud of its dinosaur. The location of the original excavation is now a National Historic Site, and a few years ago, Haddonfield commissioned a sculpture of Hattie for their downtown by artist John Gennati. Art is a really, really cool way of, of making something matter to somebody. But you see the bones, and they're really cool, but when you see, you see a drawing of a, of a dinosaur in its habitat, it starts to make much more sense. Any image that anybody has of a dinosaur, uh, that came from an artist. You can visit Hattie the Dinosaur and see Jason Poole's artistic rendering of New Jersey's official dinosaur at the New Jersey State Museum throughout 2014. How I wish that we, we could really know. The four concerts of the 2014 Raritan River Music Festival began in the early 1700s and traveled through the centuries, ending with a look to the future. The last concert featured new music commissioned by the festival. We're so pleased to be bringing new music to a historic location. We're hoping that by encouraging composers today to write more for our ensemble and for other instruments and, and voice, it gives future generations the opportunity to know what we were thinking about today. 
The founders of the festival, guitar duo Newman and Oltman, played music by contemporary composers. Also on the program was Ethel, a plugged-in 21st century string quartet. They love music and that comes across in everything they do. In fact, their logo is a big heart with the word Ethel. Usually when somebody begins thinking about a string quartet, they've got a model that probably was refined and codified about 220 years ago. And uh, it's a magnificent body of, of instruments and work, but uh, it's still adaptable. And that's the mission we've taken on with our quartet, is to uh, use that gorgeous technology in the service of contemporary music, music that, that people need to write right now. The last piece was for guitar duo and string quartet. It's by a Serbian-born American composer and was the oldest piece on the program, written way back in 1999. This fabulous piece by Dusan Bogdanovic draws on the cultural, traditional, rhythmic dance styles of the Serbs. It's passionate, it's fun, it's extremely virile, and, and uh, it's, it's complicated. It's very, very complex music that requires everybody to be minutely sensitive to each other, and we love that. It's, it's incredibly fun, it's very virtuosic. One of the things we, we do as a quartet is to try to listen to each other through music and, and maybe engage in a little you know, healing and rapprochement so that uh, we get to collaborate and, and maybe uh, participate in better solutions for all. Happy birthday, New Jersey. That's it for State of the Arts NJ this week. To share any of the stories you've just seen or to see more, visit stateoftheartsnj.com. While you're there, check out our blog or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for watching.